what we've been doing, and we're back to it now again in our Sunday mornings, is uh, having uh, church sermons and Sunday school classes on the same theme. And these themes started out in the early part of the year being what we believed, uh, those truths of the Christian faith. And uh, then we have moved into the second section, which is how should we then live? If it's true, if what we believe is true, and if we really believe it, uh, how will that be affecting our lives? The last time I preached up here, I preached on total surrender. If, if Jesus Christ is Lord, if God is sovereign, uh, if we have been uh, purchased from our uh, slavery to sin and death by the blood of Jesus Christ, uh, if we have died and our life is now hidden with him, one day to be revealed in him, then we are Christ's. We are not our own. We belong to him. And that total surrender is that idea that everything we have then is ultimately his. And we are here to ultimately worship him and serve him through it. And by the way, this is, this, this is life in Christ. This is the Christian faith. What we're saying here is not radical. Total surrender is not radical Christian teaching. It is Christian teaching. Anything less than that is sub-Christian. You know, sometimes we get the idea that there, there's Christians who are just sort of okay people that come to church on Sunday. Then there's those real, you know, radical spiritual ones that actually serve him. You study scripture, there's no category of people that know the Lord and don't serve him. There's no category of people who just go through the motions. There's followers of Jesus or there are not followers of Jesus. So we're not saying radical things here. We're talking about the genuine Christian faith. And by the way, in our day and age, that we hear reports that many, many young people especially are leaving the church. You know what they're leaving? They're leaving the church where people just come on Sunday morning and do their minimal duties. Baptize, confirm, take communion, et cetera, et cetera, and that's it. They're leaving that because there's no reality to it. They're not leaving genuine Christianity which is a dynamic life of power, transformed and being transformed by the presence of Jesus Christ, living not the same we used to live, and loving and sharing in a radical way that will draw all human beings to him. That's genuine Christianity. That's not radical Christianity. That's just the real thing. So that's what we talk about when we talk about uh, total surrender. Now, this message is kind of a subset on that total surrender. What we're talking about today is offering our time. Is Jesus Lord of your time? You know, time is something that we've all been given the same amount of. We are, are people that live in a world where there's different levels of income, there's different levels of education, there's different levels of ability, but we've all been giving something, all been given something equal, and that is time. Now, when we talk about offering our time, we're not talking about every second of every day thinking about God and doing something that's like Christian. We can't do that. We need rest. We need recreation. We need sleep. We need to go to work. We need to make a living. We need to deal with kids. All those kind of things we're doing. But what we are talking about is, in the midst of all that, are those things under the lordship of Jesus Christ. So we're going to start here. God is with us every minute of every day. Is that not true? We started out with our theology. Is that not our God? Is he not omnipresent everywhere at once? Psalm 139 says, where can we go to get away from God? We, wherever you try, he's going to be there. You will not get away from him. A uh, really interesting passage of scripture is John chapter 1, verses 47 through 50, talking about Nathaniel. It's a fascinating little couple of verses. Nathaniel. I'm going to read these for you. John 1, 47, Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Now, Jesus had never met Nathanael. And so Nathanael's coming up to him. Nathanael's never met Jesus. Jesus sees him and says, Behold, an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Basically, he says, Now there is a truly honest Israelite. Nathaniel says to him, as you might imagine, how do you know me? You know, how, how can you make such a statement? We have never met. And Jesus said to him, before Philip called you, 
When you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Now, we are not told what was going on under that fig tree. But whatever it was, it is something that Jesus, based on his statement, there is a truly honest Israelite. And when Nathanael heard him say that, I saw you under the fig tree, his response was this, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. When he said that to him, that told Nathanael, Jesus was there under the fig tree. And that told him, this guy is, is the one. This guy is the real deal. He is the son of God. Jesus answered him and said, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. He said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. The point being, he was there under the fig tree. He is there with you on the golf course. He's there with you when you're making out your income tax forms. He's there with you when you're on your computer. He's there with you when you're texting on your cell phone or watching TV or etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. He is there every minute of our time. He is present with us. We, we start there. All the stewardship parables of Jesus, and he did several stewardship parables, have one thing in common. All those stewards had to give account of their stewardship. We will one day give account for how we use our time. That's where we begin here. He's there every minute. We will one day give account of every minute we have spent. Now, this is not telling you, okay, we have to start worrying about being Christian all the time, whatever that means, and always thinking spiritual thoughts and always doing spiritual things and, and always focusing on serving Jesus every minute because we have to give account. That's how you fall into legalism. We are saved by grace, and we live by grace. And the account that we have to give is not judgment. We're not worried about being judged. Because if you, if you start spending your time in such a way so as not to be judged, that is the lowest form of Christian obedience. And really leads to legalism. We do what we do ultimately out of love for the one who saved our souls and has passed us out of judgment and has already forgiven us for our failure to use our time well, right? Already forgiven, that account is not judgment. But what he calls us to is worship, and to use your time to honor the Lord is the ultimate act of worship, the ultimate thing we can give him. You know, when we talk about giving him our lives, we're really talking about giving him our time. Because that is, in many ways, our most Precious treasure. Remember the story of the rich young ruler? Of course you do. He had many, many things, and he wanted to know how to inherit eternal life. And Jesus said, keep the commandments. And he said, great, I've been doing that. And Jesus said, one more thing. Sell all you have, give it to the poor, and get treasure in heaven, and then follow me. He went away sad because he had much, and he was not willing to part with it. By the way, the Apostle Paul in Philippians 3 reveals the opposite. He says, all these wonderful things that I had, I consider as garbage compared to the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. But at any rate, uh, the rich young ruler went away sad. Our greatest treasure that we have is our time. We only have so much of it. And we all have the same amount of it. And... Jesus says to us, go ahead and give your time to serving others, to serving me. Get treasure in heaven. Use your time in following me. So what will our answer be? Will we go away sad going, ah, oh, there's so much stuff I love to do. Well, you know, Jesus isn't calling us to give up things that we love to do. He's calling us to surrender 
ourselves and our time to him, to, to deflect those things from our glory to his, from just our pleasure alone to his pleasure. Turn with me, please, to Ephesians 5. That's where we're going to park today, Ephesians 5. The book of Ephesians is very similar to the uh, series we've been going through with sermons and Sunday school because the first three chapters are theology, what we believe. The first three chapters of Ephesians tell us all the magnificent blessings we have in Christ Jesus, that we have been saved by grace, that we were once lost, now we have been found, and that we have been uh, made partakers of the ministry of Jesus Christ. All that's in the first three chapters. The second three chapters, four, five, and six, are about, if that is true, how should we then live? Chapter four starts, I, a prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling of which you've been called. And it goes on along those lines. If those things are true, how should we live? Really, Ephesians chapter four through six, once again, are talking about authentic Christianity. Not the kind of Christianity where you come to church on Sunday morning. And that's what you call your, your faith. But the real deal, chapter 5 of Ephesians is talking about the real deal Christianity following Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit. Here's what it says. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Imitate that as beloved children. Walk means to live. When you say walk in Ephesians, it means live. Walk in love means live in love the way Christ loved the church. Later on in Ephesians, he brings that into the marriage thing and talks about husbands loving your wives the way Christ loved the church when he gave himself up for her. He starts out by saying, in all things, every one of us, Live our life in the kind of love that Christ showed when he gave himself up and offering a sacrifice to God, a fragrant aroma. So those people that say the Christian faith is all about love are right. But it's not the kind of love that's genuinely human love, like just have good feelings and make everyone around you feel happy and good. It's love the way Christ did when he gave his life as an offering, as an act of worship. Give your lives as an act of worship to the Lord. Romans 12 tells us that's, the, that's our service of worship, how we present our lives as a living and holy sacrifice. Now, those who like to say that the Bible and Jesus just said love one another like to use that in our world today and in way too many of our churches today, by the way, to be a license for, for not doing many other things we are called to do. In other words, they will say, just love. Don't get so judgmental. We hear that, don't we? Don't get so legalistic. Just love. Well, listen to what this love is all about. This, this is the real deal here. Ephesians 5. Be imitators of God. We read that one. Then we go to verse 3. Uh, but immorality and impurity and greed must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. There must be no filthiness or silly talk or coarse jesting, which is not fitting, but rather the giving of thanks. It's okay, talking about imitating our Lord and walking in love the way Christ loved us also means throwing aside any whispers of immorality or impurity, which, by the way, our world revels in. By the way, just for the record, according to Scripture, that includes homosexuality. Man, our church, generally speaking, the church out there has surrendered that one these days. And you know what? It's not love. It's not love. Because it's telling people they're okay when the Bible says, no, they face the wrath of God. Is that love? If you know somebody is living a lifestyle that will kill them, especially kill them eternally, is it love to say, oh, that's okay, I celebrate that with you? It may make you popular with them. But is that love? If your kids are living a life that's killing them, is it love to enable them? So at any rate, let immorality, impurity, greed not even be named among you. There must be no filthy or silly talk. Let's live our lives morally and purely. Why? Because of Christ. Because of what he's done for us. And let's let our talk be thanksgiving. 
and positive blessing and upbuilding. Not the kind of junk we hear all over the, the world and on the TV and on the internet and, and in the blogosphere and all those kind of things. Verse 5, and know this with certainty that no immoral or impure person or covetous man or idolater or has an inheritance in the kingdom of God. You see, it is all about grace, but it's not grace for everybody. It's grace for those in Christ. And those in Christ have been transformed by the power of God. Real Christianity, not just the I'm coming on Sunday morning, I'm a Christian thing. They've been transformed and are being transformed in ways that say, I put off this stuff. I'm throwing off this junk. I'm talking in a different way. I'm living in a different way because Christ is now within me. Titus chapter 2, talking about grace, says the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sens sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking forward to the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. That's grace. It isn't just for salvation. It's for a life that begins changing, throwing off the crude stuff, throwing off the sensual stuff, throwing off the vulgar stuff for the sake of God because he is within us, knowing that those are the very things that bring the wrath of God. Those are the symptoms of the wrath of God coming. Verse 6, no, no one deceive you with empty words because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Don't let some of the, so many, many churches who have checked out in our day and age to be popular tell you, no, 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 those things are not important. It's all grace. Just love one another and accept everything because that's what God did. No, no, no. Those are deceptive words. Those are empty words. It's because of those things the wrath of God will come. And by the way, the wrath of God's coming as sure as Jesus is coming again. He came the first time for grace to save us by his blood on the cross. He's coming the second time to claim his own and then judge the rest of the world with his righteous wrath. And our God is a God of love, but that's not all he is. We learned that in our theology part. He is also a God of wrath. Verse 7, do not be partakers with them, for you formerly were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk, live as children of light. In other words, be different. Verse 9, for the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, and righteousness and truth, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them, for it's disgraceful to even speak of the things which are done by them in secret. But all things become visible when they are exposed to the light, for everything that becomes visible is light. We are called to live the life that imitates our Lord Jesus Christ in being light in this dark world, in making a stand for righteousness in a world that has increasingly lowered the bar of unrighteousness to where even churches are saying that stuff is all okay as long as you believe. And it's all grace and it's all love and just love one another and everything else is fine as long as you're loving one another. And there's no hell anyway, so don't worry about it. It's being taught in many, many churches today, unfortunately. I say with sorrow. We are called to be people of the book, we are called to be people of light in this dark world, making our stand, no matter how unpopular it might be. We are called to nothing less. This is real Christianity, not just the going to church stuff. For this reason, it says, awake sleeper, arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Now we get to the verses we've been waiting for in this passage. Therefore, be careful how you walk, in other words, live. Be careful how you live, not as unwise, but wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. We all have the same treasure, the treasure of our time, our hours. We all have the same number of them. Some of us may need more sleep than others, but we all have the same number of hours. It says, now because of all this, because we're living in a dark world and we're living as light and we are being transformed by Jesus Christ and, and called to imitate him and seeking to learn what is pleasing to him, take care, be careful. Uh, 
Look carefully at how you are living. Be wise, not unwise, making the most of these hours that you have because the days are evil. What does that mean? The days are evil? Are days evil? Well, no, it's not talking about the day as in Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. It's talking about the time in which we live, the world in which we live. We live in a fallen world. The enemy, Satan, is the ruler of this world. He is a deceiver. We live in a world of deception. My goodness, look at the politics these days. You want to talk about a world of deception. We're living in it. And it's affecting each and every one of us. And so we are called within that world, because the world that we live in is as it is, we are called to live carefully. Open your eyes. See what you're doing. Look at what the Word of God truly says. And because we are called to be lights in this dark world, because these days are evil, we need to use our time. We are the ones who have the answer for the darkness of this world. It's the light of Jesus Christ. We are the ones who have the answer for the wrath of God, which is coming. It is the grace of Jesus Christ unto salvation. We have the answer for the curse that is upon this world and everyone in it. It's the curse breaker, the cross of Jesus Christ. We have the gospel. That's why it is good news. So be careful how you live your life. Making the most of the minutes you have because you're in the middle of this world that is dead and dying and we have the cure. So we use our time for kingdom purposes. It doesn't mean you have to dramatically change what you're doing. You have to work, okay, at work. Where can you be a light that shines? Is there someone you work with for whom you can be a light? Draw them to Jesus. In your recreation, that's fine, do that. Do whatever you, you love to do to relax, but start looking around you and saying, this isn't just about me. Which one of my people that I recreate with could use some light? How can I be a salt and a light for the kingdom of God, even when I'm having fun? You know, the, the cruise we were on was great. It's wonderful, just relaxing. On those cruises, you don't do anything. Everything's done for you. You don't even turn down your own bed. Your big decisions are, where will I eat next? The buffet or one of the five wonderful restaurants. That, that's your whole life. What I found, though, as that week went on, the last couple days, talking to some of the people in our group, I heard things like, man, I'm praying that the Lord will sit me next to somebody who needs someone to talk to. I thought, yes, even on a cruise. You can use your time wisely for kingdom purposes. There's people on that boat that need some light in the midst of their darkness. By the way, our Bible studies grew every time, so I know people were talking to people next to them. We went from 22, which is the number of people we had in our church group, 25 or so the next time. I think we had about 30 the last one. They kept moving us to bigger rooms on the boat, which tells me, yeah, there was some kingdom stuff going on there. There were some conversations, some invitations. Uh, so we can do that. Be careful how you walk, not as unwise but wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is and do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. The example he uses is drinking alcohol. That's a, that's a good example for us today as well. Make the most of your time. Don't just revel in drunkenness. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. In other words, make the kingdom of God one of the priorities of your time, no matter what you're doing, saying, what am I doing for the kingdom? Why does God have me here? How can I be a salt and light in this situation right where I am? Speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody with your heart to the Lord. And by the way, joy should be the fragrance that we emit as Christians, should it not? The joy of the Lord is, Lord is our strength. That's what people should see when they come in contact with us. They should see genuine joy. Why? Okay, our sins are forgiven. We are adopted by the king of the universe, heirs of eternal glory. He is living within us and promises never to leave us or forsake us. How can we not be joyful? Well, we're not joyful when we get deceived by the king of this world into thinking these difficulties that we go through every day, 
in this life are somehow going to affect us ultimately. When they're not, we're kids of the king. Yeah, we may suffer for a while, but that too God will use for his purposes. Always giving thanks in all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. In other words, consider others more important than yourself, which gets us back to verse 1. Be imitators of God as beloved children, walk in love as Christ loved when he gave himself up for us. We come full circle. To live a life under the lordship of Jesus Christ is to commit your time, your hours to serving him. It doesn't mean that you can't have any fun. It means that in the midst of the things we do, we say, okay, Lord, how can I be light? What have you called me to be? What divine appointments have you made for me today? That is serving him with our time. We are like the rich young ruler. We are wealthy with minutes and hours and days. Jesus says, great. Give them to me and follow me. Are you willing? Let's pray.